You welcome to this morning on ITV, the discussion, the first discussion segment. And you know ITV is certainly the best. I am your host, Ebenezer Oyetakin, on the platform of nationalism and you. At the beginning of uh, or rounding up last week, Friday precisely, Nigeria celebrated 61 years of our independence. There have been people who think we have done so much as a nation and recorded landmarks of progresses. There are others that think that we have not done what we ought to do and that at 60 we are still crawling. That is the spirit at which we will be examining the Nigeria nation today. And we will be taking a look at it from the window of certain agenda. Because in another 12 months now, we will be celebrating again 62 years of our nationhood. Setting an agenda, building a nation in line with our national anthems and pledges. That is what we will be looking this morning. And to look at this with me is no other than our very own Ahmad Saju, a former commissioner of information and strategy at Damawa State. You are welcome to our studio, sir. Thank you very much. Nigeria at 61. Your opinion? Well, <laughs> the, the basket is full and is mixed. You have apples, you have oranges, <laughs> you have lemons, <laughs> and you even have some bitter fruits, you know. So <laughs> we, we've gone through quite a lot. There are developments. There's no doubt about it. We're sitting in Abuja. 61 years ago, there was nothing like Abuja. We were one of the very few countries in the world that have migrated from an old capital and developed a new capital completely from the scratch. And we are sitting in that capital and working and serving our country. And I think that is a tremendous development. We have also grown from three subnational capitals to 36 subnational capitals. That is also a tremendous stride. And with all the infrastructure and paraphernalia of governance in those places, we've been able to, to really make some, some giant strides. We've developed uh, our infrastructure to some level. We've uh, developed our administrative structures to some level. We have uh, developed our human capacity to some level. We had, uh, by 60, we had one or two universities today we have nearly 300 universities these are all definitely some giant strides in the country as at as at uh, independence the secondary schools in ibadan alone were more than all the secondary schools in northern nigeria mm. today you can't say the same we've moved we've progressed we have uh, some tertiary inst health institutions we have, we have developed ourselves to some level. To that extent, yes, you could say, yeah, we have progressed. As at the time, you know, we had independence. Uh, the, only t the only person that had the right to own a television station, for example, was only the government. Today we are only talking on a private television station. That too is some measure of progress for our country. That, that I agree. But I think on the flip side... We've also lost so much. And we've lost so much so that um, the level of unity and cohesion that we enjoy that independence is no longer there. We are fragmented, divided, suspicious of each other, unable to look each other in the face and feel a sense of brotherhood. Yes, Our yes. first anthem mm -hmm. said... Though tribe and tongue may differ, 
in brotherhood we stand. We stood in brotherhood to a large extent. We had our misunderstandings and skirmishes, but they were not as pronounced as we have them today. So in terms of our social interactions, we did not move much further. Now, in terms of the crisis we are facing today, uh, banditry, insurgency, armed robbery, kidnapping, and all that, we also have not, you know, we cannot clap for ourselves for arrive, arriving at this sorry station. In the past, we had, we had so, uh, you know, security challenges up to the point of fighting a civil war. But now it's nationwide. The civil war was isolated, but this one is nationwide. Everywhere is not safe. Everywhere it is. So, and we are not speaking with the same voice. The worst offense that has happened to us in this country is that even our sense of right and wrong, we lost it. People look at right and wrong from certain perspective. If you, a, person, a tribes person commits an offense, well, he is not guilty from your point of view. If you are, <laughs> you are a religious person commits an offense, he is not guilty from your point of view. That, uh, that position is really, really, really retarding even the progress of this country. And that is my, my, my fear. Your analysis actually <clears throat> re-engineer hope, particularly from where we're coming from and where we are. But the final vision. But let us do something because we forgot to do it and we have to return to it before we progress. And that is, I am going to revert to you now that our normal ritual on this program, <laughs> program. nationalism and you. So I say, Ama Sajo, nationalism and you. Well, it is my duty and responsibility to help develop this country. Very well. And that is the spirit. You you almost you took it out of me because I was I was going to look at it from that perspective, but you have addressed it, and that is um, our first national anthem. Nigeria, we hail the our own native mother's land. Though tribes and tongue we may differ, in brotherhood we stand. Then when you move away from there, the, even the new national anthem emphasized that the kind of country we want to build is one nation that is bound in freedom, peace, and, and justice. And justice, exactly. We have peace and justice reign. Reign, yes. It presupposes that our founding fathers... Yeah. They understood the fact that the kind of nation we need to build is that which converge our diversities to strength. Are we taking deliberate effort, proactive deliberate effort, to define our nation to suit this well-crafted intentment of our founding fathers, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think, let me start by uh, explaining to you why the first national anthem was actually the best for the country. But there, there were wordings in that national anthem that fell short of our aspirations as a nation. Uh, if, you, if you go to the dictionary meaning of tribe, it speaks about primitive set of people. We are not primitive. Even before the white man came, some sections of this country were actually highly sophisticated. So we wouldn't have described ourselves in terms that re relates to us as primitive people. And then when it says in brotherhood we stand, it, it's like the country is a fraternity. But we are not a fraternity, we are a fraternity, we are a sorority. <laughs> we are men, we are women. So, so... And they, they, they felt that brotherhood could stand for both brothers and sisters. But, you know, to a large extent, I think uh, it, it's, it's better we don't define ourselves in the male gender. We are a collection, a country that is, that is presently, that is working very hard to bridge the infrastructure gap 
that has been left lingering for all the 60 something years to, 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 to try to correct the infrastructure deficit that create that you know we faced mm -hmm. for all these years uh, we shouldn't be talking about w roads we shouldn't be talking about rails we shouldn't be talking about water supply we shouldn't be these are things within the 61 years we should have gone right. you know beyond you know so so we have a huge infrastructure deficit we're trying to correct it but why did we have this infrastructure deficit was that because there was a pervasive level of corruption people took out money meant for social services and put it in their pocket some wickedly took it abroad forgot about it some even put it in coded accounts that when they die those coded accounts will not even be accessible to their families such a wicked kind of uh, leadership we had now it came down to now these people who have accumulated so much have become so powerful that they are the, the determinants of what what goes on in this country they set the agenda they have the template for the governance and if you deviate a little from that template that they have set that enables them mm. you know benefit uh, illegally from the system you are confronted with resistance and because they have resources they have power they have connections they have accumulated a lot of i can't call it goodwill but bad will within the rogue structure of the of the world they determine a lot of things and so we are all suffering the after effect of this high level of misgovernance and bigandage over the last 60, 60 years or so and so because of that we lost our our momentum we lost our direction we lost our capacity to even look at issues dispassionately and uh, design modalities for overcoming some of our challenges to add salt to injury we now lost our humanity and we don't see each other as human beings again we 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 we, we don't see human lives as in having any value we we we, we kill at will as you life that you cannot give you take away at will now it has reached a point where if you fall into a river today and you are drowning the people around even if they know how to swim will not jump in to pull you out they will stand outside that river carry their little camera and start filming so that they can post online mm. if you have an accident today god forbid what they will do is some will come and be filming you you in pains some will search for your this your expensive wrist watch <laughs> some will look for your expensive phone some will look at with the, we have lost our sense of humanity <laughs> so, so so to that extent I, I feel sad nigeria at 61 i wish it was a human being i would have said retire Seriously speaking, no, 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 that we cannot say retire. <laughs> but but we need to, like you said, recalibrate ourselves. What do we do going forward? How do we change ourselves going forward? And I will I will give you a very simple and straightforward answer. There's only one thing lacking in this country. We have all the endowment. God, in His infinite mercy, has been very merciful to this country even the COVID-19 that has been ravaging the world did not do much damage to us in this country we did not face we were not we were not challenged like India with our population we we're not challenged like Brazil we we're not even challenged like the USA we we're not challenged like Britain we were not challenged there was no need to do a lockdown, open up lockdown, open up lockdown, like, uh, oh, like exactly, like uh, Fela's song. <laughs> no, we didn't have to go through all this. We're mercifully spared by God Almighty. We never had any disaster 
natural disaster that is beyond ourselves to cope with. No earthquake, no volcano, no tsunami at the coastal region, nothing to, to make us, uh, no I'm, wildfire. I'm, I'm, I'm coming. Okay. We, are, we don't have all this. The only disaster we have is ourselves. We are the only, we are all, only disaster. How do we get out of all this? The answer is in one word. Leadership. A leadership we can trust. A leadership that lives within the tenets of the laws that have been set up out by, it, by itself for, for, this, for the system. A leadership that is empathetic to us as the followership. A leadership that lives within the realms of some of the difficulties we face. A leadership that understands that there are certain directions a people must follow to arrive at the destination of prosperity that the people require. That's the kind of leadership we do not, we did not have in our 60-something years of independence. Of course, our founding fathers were, to a large extent, better. They were disciplined to a large, to some extent. They were, they were frugal. They were, they, 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 they lived a, they, 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 a simple life that we can relate with. Not this one that, be, to, to, yeah, today you will be riding Okada with somebody. Tomorrow he is elected councillor. He buys a car and builds a very big house and then puts two dogs there, the Megad and a huge gate. You go to him, uh, 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 were we not the ones that were playing together? Say, go and tell him, level has changed. That's the kind of leadership we have. And it is totally disconnects from you. But so if you disconnect from me, how do you better my life? Taking it from, taking it from there, <clears throat> it appears that our behaviors, both as leaders as, and citizens, is what has led us to this state of affairs where we lost our humanity, where yeah. human life is no longer valued. Oh, and uh, we, have totally <clears throat> we have totally deviated from the spirit and letter of our crafted national articles, or, uh, you know, article of, uh, of, of our code of conduct as enshrined in our national pledges and ante. For example, in our coat of arm, you have the word unity and faith, peace and progress. So what should we be doing consciously now as a people in order to regenerate our humanity and be able to align our country to the spirit and letter of our national anthem in order to achieve the nation of the dream of our founding fathers very and our collective aspirations. Very, very, very simple. I'm a Muslim, and, 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 and I thank God for being a Muslim. And I will tell you very clearly that in Islam we say, if the prayer is correct, that means the imam has led the people correctly. If the prayer is faulty, <laughs> the imam did not lead people correctly. And I, I tell you, I grew up within a Catholic community. And I, I, I do attend Catholic Mass when I was a kid. I understand that the Reverend Father leads the Mass. Mm -hmm. And it is the way he conducts the Mass that the Mass goes. Why am I telling you all of this? It's to make you understand that it is a leadership question. The leadership must lead by example, and the leadership must set the template, the, 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 the tempo for the followership. And, you know, uh, one of the great Islamic scholars that I have read his works, had written that a kingdom change that to nation huh? yes. a kingdom can survive thrive and prosper 
under an unbelieving ruler. But if there is fairness and justice. Mm. But that a kingdom, take that for nation again, yes, cannot survive, thrive, and prosper under a believing ruler who is not, if there is no fairness and justice. So it's just simple. What is good for Ebenezer should be good for Sajo. If my children will have to go abroad to be educated, your children should also go, to, go abroad to be educated. I cannot, for example, you know, carry your own children to serve as thugs in my political campaign while I send my children to school, whether Nigeria or abroad. It's unfair. Where my child is looking towards becoming a responsible professional, I am hoping that your child becomes an Okada rider and you expect that things go well. Let me give you an example. We have a crisis in northern Nigeria. We've not been able to find a solution to that crisis. And that crisis is at the root of every insecurity we are facing in northern Nigeria. The Almajiri system. Why would somebody give birth to a child in Sokoto? And at the age of four, five, take him and hand him over to a supposed scholar. To take him to Maiduguri or Bama. This child grows in the street begging for food. Automatically, you've killed the spirit of self-reliance in him. He grows up without mommy, daddy. So you've removed love from his heart. He grew up without brother, sister, cousin. You've removed empathy and sense of community family from him then he grows up and becomes an adult and then he has not learned any skill he, he, has, he does not have any modern knowledge he has not learned any skill and then you throw him onto the society do you expect him to have mercy for you are you are you kidding yourself such a person will have mercy, mercy for you no so if Boko Haram comes and says, come and join us, he will. If bandits come and say, let us go and, uh, and, and, and kidnap uh, Oyatikin, he will. <laughs> no, seriously. It is pathetic. You are breeding a group of people who do not have love in their heart. And you expect love in return from them? It's impossible. I'm sorry, but I'm just, yes. I'm just telling you that at the root of some of our crises in this country are honest, you know, uh, mistakes we have made and we're keeping to them. And take our clergy, Islamic scholars, church uh, b -b -b pastors. What are they teaching? What do they stand on the pulpit to talk? They will tell you sometimes, vote for a leader who is God-fearing, who goes to church every morning, who goes to mosque every morning? Rubbish. I did not vote for you to go to mosque or church. Go to your mosque. It's for you. In between you and your God. How many preachers have you heard preach about either Islamic economy or Christian concept of the economy? How many preachers sit down and say unemployment is bad? How many preachers sit down and say wealth distribution, social inequality is forbidden in, 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 in Islam or in Christianity? But that, but that is true. Social inequality is not supported by the Quran or the Bible. But we're, we're, we're increasing social inequality. The rich are becoming richer. The poor are becoming poorer. And we're looking at them. And then we, 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 we say, because the leader himself goes to church, sits in the first pew, and, uh, and, and we clap for him, it shall be permanent, what the Lord has done for you. How, how can his own be permanent and then our own be temporary? Distorted. Um, one a singer said, <coughs> I don't want peace, give me, <coughs> give me justice. 
Peter Tosh. You, 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 you have laid a foundation of the, of the discourse in such a way that it generates so much passion than I have an, anticipated. But you will also agree with me that preponderant of our people that are in leadership today, most of them, if you ask them to even recite the national anthem, they cannot. Most of them don't even think about the wordings of those national anthem or the pledge. Should we? Many people have said that we should have a system that make the reciting of the national anthem, the pledge, and the rest of it a, 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 a daily thing. For example, you enter your office before you, you, you start your work, you recite it on your table and the rest of it to yourself, you know, building the, those kind of consciousness. Do you think that can generate? <laughs> Let me, let, me, let, me, let me laugh at uh, sometimes the level of naivety of our people in, 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 in thinking of way out of some of our problems. Let me, let me be honest with you. Uh, you know, peace is not the, presence, um, the absence of conflict. It's the presence of social justice. Conflict alone does not threaten your peace. What threatens your peace? is the absence of social justice. If there is social justice, we will not be threatened. We will be in harmony with ourselves. That's num number one. Number two, I don't know if you've seen this joke about our national pledge. You say, I pledge to Nigeria, my country. That is for our leaders. To be faithful, loyal, and honest. That is for our senior civil servants. To serve Nigeria with all my strength. <laughs> <laughs> that's for people who have uh, no i think to be to be faithful loyal and honest are the people who are the captains of industry who are making money out of the system mm -hmm. uh -huh. to serve nigeria with all uh, my strength is for the civil servant to defend our unity and uphold our honor and glory is for the uniformed services so help me god is for those of us who are the masses because all we all the pledge had left for us is so help me god <laughs> the, the word that is left for <laughs> <the> us, <rest of laughs> ordinary people. <laughs> so, so, so even if you ask them to recite it every day, they will recite the portion that concerns them and imbibe. <laughs> Talking about so, 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 so yes. please, that cannot solve our problem. What can solve our problem is a genuine commitment to live in peace and harmony as a people, and to live in peace and harmony means fairness. Yeah, equity, fairness, and justice for everybody. Uh, there, there, there is a trend that is ongoing presently. Yeah. The trend of antagonism between, uh, you know, or, or, or what seems a widening divide between the, the northern governor and the southern governor. It seems it is coming as a new creation. The northern, gov the southern governors will, will, will spring up and say something from this way, and the northern governors will say something from this way, and the rest of it as a... Are you comfortable with such a trend? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me tell you. Yes. Since the creation of states, the northern governors have been meeting. You know, when the states were created, there were common assets of northern Nigeria, which was under an agency called ICSA, Interim Common Services Agency. And some of these common services, as I mean, common agencies, mm -hmm. are still there. The New Nigeria Development Company, NNDC, is still a North, is owned by the northern states. So they've been meeting, you know, to advance common interests of northern Nigeria. The only thing they have not done was to advance a political interest, you know. Uh, but every quarter of the year, the Secretary of the Governments of Northern Nigeria will first meet in Kaduna. Mm -hmm. Then they set the agenda for their governors to come and meet. Okay. It's always been there, but it was not political. Now, for the Southern governors, there was no fulcrum upon which they will situate their common 
agenda because there is no common asset owned by the southern states suddenly there is the political expediency <laughs> required that the southern states should come together and advance political interests and they came together and began to advance political interests now the northern governors realizing that their concert of common economic or developmental interest is replicated in the south but given political undertone also now adopted <laughs> mm -hmm. a political undertone <laughs> into their own so they are all playing politics i tell you one thing you know these are I but the way they are doing it presently, is it helpful to our it. national unity? No, 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 no. Don't worry. I, I am coming to that. Okay. I think what they are doing now will be extremely helpful for the country. Okay. And I will tell you why. Why? Now, by the time we have started getting common political interests in the North, and common political interests in the South. And by the time these common political interests are brought to the table, it will be much easier for us to identify a common political interest for the country. It's just beginning now. And when something starts and is new, the, the spirit, the human spirit is to resist, resistance. Mm -hmm. But for me, I see a very positive side of it. Now we will begin to address some of the lies we tell ourselves that we normally sweep under the carpet. We bring them up and put them on table and say, look, as Southerners, these are our political interests that are not met by the larger federation. Northerners will say, okay, as Northerners, these are our political interests that are not met by the larger federation. What do we do? Let's put them on table. Look, uh, the South, you must give in. Because this and this and this, if it is done, it will create this much upheaval up North. Okay, you, the North, you must also give in. Because this and this and this and this, if it's acceded, it will bring political upheaval in the South. We will now begin to identify what are those common factors that can be acceptable North and South. Probably that will strengthen our unity. But, but this is the beginning. This is the beginning. And this beginning that you think is creating tension, for me it's not creating tension. It's actually a pathway. It's a roadmap to identifying, to telling ourselves the truth. Remember, when Namdi Azikiwe told Amadou Bello, Amadou Bello, let us forget our differences and work together. Amadou Bello said, no, it's not possible. Let us understand our differences so we can work together. Mm. If you do not understand yourselves, you can't work together. If you decide to say you are forgetting, it's impossible. I am a northerner. I'm a Muslim. Tell me how I can forget that <laughs> in dealing with any other person. You are, because your socialization template is determined by where you come from, your environment. So there are certain things you do. For example, you do ballet. For me, I don't do ballet. But if I understand the essence of your do ballet, it will, I, I, I won't feel bad about it. Just as if I go to your father and I don't do ballet for him, you won't get angry with me because you understand that my social background is that do ballet is not part of our culture. So we need to begin to now politically understand where we, we each stand so we can construct our unity when, we, when, when we are with Ahmad Sajo we can go on on and on and on but Ahmad Sajo before you go one word hmm. um, this segmented description of our of our national anthem that you particularly <laughs> this low the, the, so those, those so one that so we let so at the, help, at the, so help, me so help me God at the level of so help God how do we galvanize them and mainstream them 
-hmm. into confidence, having more confidence on the nation, and your last word to the, our political leaders and the city. No, 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 no. As for the ordinary, <laughs> ordinary people, their expectation is equity, fairness, and justice. Provide equal opportunities for everybody. And whoever makes it to the top, that's how we all made it to the top. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I, I, I am not from a privileged background, mm -hmm. but because the system provided an equal opportunity for me, a platform for me to rise, I rose to wherever I am today. If, even if you don't, if you feel I, have, I am not a millionaire or I am not a minister, but at least I am uh, comfortably up the ladder, that must be created for the other people that are down there. For our politicians, I think they must understand that the calling called politics is a service calling. It's not a calling for attainment of privilege, privileged positions. This is where we got it all wrong. Our politicians do not go into politics with the interest of service. They go into politics with the interest of attaining the privileges that uh, political positions confer. And I think we need to rec recalibrate that. Thank you very much. It is wonderful having you today. And we hope when we have the cost to call upon you again, you will avail us yourself. We are always uh, excited to have you on this platform. Uh, that is you. the first thank segment. You. Thank you very much. That is the My first pleasure. segment of our discourse on setting agenda, building a nation in line with our national anthem. And we hope that our leaders watching us have heard from Nigerians the expectations and things of that nature. We can do much, much better. We have come a long way. We have reasons to celebrate and as a nation, our independence, but we have greater room for improvement. Thank you very much, Ahmad Sabju. Thank you very much. I'm really, really very grateful to be here and always ready to, be, to come and be with you.